HPC architectures. And uh, specifically, we're going to look at the two main types of um, architectures that we see in HPC. So shared memory architectures, which you will have come across a little bit um, in previous lectures yesterday, and distributed memory architectures. We'll also cover hybrid memory uh, architecture, so that's where you combine shared memory and distributed memory. We'll look at how accelerators fit into virtual HPC architectures, and finally, what is the difference between um, HPC facility tiers? And uh, some of you may come across this already. I'll just go into a little bit of detail about that. Okay, so shared memory architectures. The tagline basically is that they're simple to use in principle, uh, but they're the hardest to build. And uh, hardest to build in the sense that they're hardest to build to very large sizes, like, say, for example, Arch. What is a shared memory architecture? <coughs> so um, they were very common. Um, well, they, have been, they are common since the early 90s. But in the early 90s, you had single, uh, single core processors. Um, and of course, now you have multi-sockets sharing a common memory system. So the idea is that you have processors that share memory, hence shared memory architecture. Another key idea uh, with shared memory architectures is that they have one operating system. And that's quite important, as you will see later on, as to why we can't scale these machines up, uh, these architectures up to large machines. Um, of course, on your multi-core laptop, you have um, shared memory because you have multi-core processors, and they are just shared memory architectures, but on a, on a chip. If you try to look for a single core processor, you might have to go to eBay or something like that, because they're pretty much not around anymore. So you will have seen this picture, I believe, yesterday. You've got all your different processors, and they've got a shared memory um, over them. And as I said, this is pretty much like your multi-core. This is what you have on your multi-core laptop, your multi-core processors. Um, and crucially, there is just one operating system handling all the memory and core utilization. Okay. So symmetry multiprocessing architectures, SMP, actually they that was the term for shared memory architectures a long time ago. So if you hear SMP, people are talking about um, shared memory architectures. And the symmetric term in that in that name comes from the fact that of course all the cores have uniform access to memory. Okay. But that's only one type of memory architecture for shared memory architectures. Um, now, in reality, what you get a lot of and what you typically see is non-uniform memory access architectures. So again, we have uh, multiple processors, but now the memory um, access is differential. And by that, I mean for cores on this processor, they will have fast access to their own local uh, memory, but they can also access, of course, the memory of other processors, but this is going to be a lot slower. So it's going to be higher latency and low bandwidth. But NUMA nodes, or NUMA, sorry, NUMA architectures is what you see now a lot. You don't really see SMP that much. So yeah, just reiterating the fact that cores, of course, have faster access to their local memory. And if they're trying to access memory from another processor, it's going to be slower. And this is important for um, performance, of course, because as we'll see later, <coughs> cores that are trying to access memory elsewhere, of course, there will be a performance hit. Okay, so, so, so most computers are now shared memory machines in the sense that they're due to multi-core. Um, and true SMP architecture, so this is non-NUMA nodes, uh, non-NUMA architecture, sorry. Um, there aren't that many of them, but of course this blue gene Q, uh, blue gene Q. Um, but most machines have NUMA shared memory architectures, for example, Archer. Um, as a programmer, uh, as a user of these uh, architectures, you don't really care, or most of you don't care, most of us don't care what the memory layer is. We just write a program and we then do uh, maybe use the performance metrics to see how well our program is doing, but we don't really care too much about um, how, where the cores are um, accessing memory. Um, so this is taken care of by the operating system, and that's quite important. We want these details hidden from us. So we don't really see the difference between NUMA and SMP unless our program is such that actually this does make a difference. Now, um, as I said earlier, it's actually difficult to build really large shared memory systems with a large number of cores, so greater than about 1,024. Um, and that's because they're very expensive 
you know, specialist hardware, really expensive, and um, also they're very, very power hungry. And it's hard to keep these systems cool. And also, you need one operating system. So imagine you need one operating system over thousands and thousands of cores. Now, operating systems aren't typically designed with thousands and thousands of core, cores in mind, right? These, these are things that run on your laptop um, or on your desktop. They're not designed specifically um, in any specialized way, you know, in a great way um, for HPC uh, size machines. So that is a real uh, hurdle that uh, shared memory architectures struggle to get over. OK, so the other main type of architecture is distributed memory architecture. So basically, clusters and multi-threading. What is that? Well, we can think of it basically as a set of computers that are connected together with an interconnect. So these are, each processor here is basically an individual computer. And it's self-contained, and it's called a node. And of course, you'll know this because in Archer, um, we've got something like 4,000, just over 4,000 nodes, um, and you will have been using them. Now, each, each node, crucially, runs its own operating system. And it's not, it's not quite the same. For HPC machines, it's not fair to say, really, that um, these nodes are completely, exactly like a separate machine, like, say, a laptop, because they don't have all the features that you have on your laptop. So for example, they might not have um, uh, access to disk. They might not have um, I.O. systems in place. But they will have most of the features that a, um, a single computer will have. So these days now, pretty much almost all, not all, but pretty much all uh, HPC machines use the distributed memory architecture. And the key thing with distributed memory architectures, of course, is the interconnect. Um, so it has to be high quality because um, you need, you don't want, if you've got cores on one node and you've got cores on another node and you're trying to access thousands and thousands of cores that are distributed across these nodes, you don't want um, inter-node communication to be slow because your application is not going to do very well. Um, but typically, we find that actually, if you get a high quality interconnect, uh, you can forget the interconnect. It's not a problem. It stops being a problem. Um, and it's other things like CPU, um, memory, and I.O. that um, are the major constraints for an application. So low quality interconnects, that's about 10 megabits per second or gigabit, something like Ethernet, they don't provide the performance that um, large HPC machines like Archer need. Um, however, that doesn't mean that they're useless. Uh, low quality interconnects are good for um, if you've got a problem, for example, that has a high throughput. So if you've got very s slow, si say, loads and loads of serial jobs, like thousands and thousands of serial jobs, and you just need thousands and thousands of jobs processed, then a, a low quality in uh, interconnect will do. So for example, like a taskbar. Yeah? And if you think about it, that makes sense, because in a taskbar, and as I've said many times, the parallel tasks, you want them to be independent. You don't want any communication um, between the cores. So that's perfect for a low quality interconnect, because you don't care about how, how fast um, inter uh, cores on different nodes communicate. Um, however, for a machine like uh, Archer, a lot of the applications that we run um, have tightly coupled parallelism. So if you remember, tightly coupled parallelism um, is when uh, you have lots of communication. And therefore, it is absolutely crucial that we have an excellent interconnect. And of course, Archer does. And uh, all high-end HPC large machines have specialist interconnects, specialist hardware <coughs> for um, HPC facilities. Um, Archer has uh, the Cray Aries. Um, you can also get, of course, the IBM Vici or Q5 D Taurus, um, and all supercomputers, um, especially those, all those that are in the top 500, have um, really high quality interconnects. Smaller systems uh, can have a good um, interconnect, uh, but it's in thin band, and that's on most also uh, cluster commodity systems. Now, high ba bandwidth is relatively easy to achieve. Is you can put together your supercomputer however you want, and, and you can ensure that you get the best bandwidth possible. Um, but it's latency, which is actually much more difficult. So this is the speed with which you can, um, the time it takes to access memory. That's um, much more of a bottleneck in distributed memory architectures. OK. So I said that uh, almost all HPC machines are distributed memory. Um, actually, they're hybrid architectures. And so almost everything falls into this class. So what's a hybrid HPC architecture? <coughs> um, 
Well, in real systems now, each node ha is a basically a shared memory system. And for example, a multi-core processor. And each of these nodes are connected together through some specific topology. So your interconnect will have be a regular grid, or it could be a torus, or, or something much more complicated than that. And actually, again, it's a bit more complicated than that because, uh, as I said earlier, you don't really get SMP um, memory architectures in many machines. You get numinos. So your shared memory um, architecture has non-uniform memory access. Um, so now you have multi-socket uh, systems with multi-core processors. And crucially, of course, as I said before, that each node has its own operating system. Now, this is where you get the complexity of parallel programming. And, and, and if you think about it, there are many hierarchies um, that are trying to interact with each other. So you've got the hierarchy of parallelism, you've got the hierarchy of memory, um, latency bandwidth. So for example, with parallelism, uh, within a processor, of course, you've got um, uh, core level parallelism. And then within a node, you've got um, processor or socket level um, parallelism. And then, of course, you've got parallelism um, across nodes. And in fact, even within a core, you've got parallelism. So if you remember when I was talking about pipelines, we're talking about instruction level pipelines, so you know, really low level parallelism there that can also be exploited. Um, and if we're thinking about memory, of course, each core has its own local cache memory, fast access to memory there. And of course, within a processor, the cores have shared memory access, um, but then they also have differential access to memory on other processors within a node, and then of course, um, cores can access um, uh, other nodes by the interconnect. <coughs> so that's hugely complicated, and, and hybrid architectures are um, hugely complex, and you can see that there are many ways in which your performance will be affected by these things, um, and there are many levels at which you might want to consider um, thinking about the performance of your application. Any questions so far? Okay. So as I said, again, just to reiterate, almost all machines fall into this class. Um, typically with um, these hybrid architectures, you are sending messages and passing message passing um, between nodes, and typically we use MPI. That's the sort of standard now in, in HPC for most um, applications. And you use typically a single processor, a single MPI process per core. Um, but now, with hybrid architectures, and as they're developing, and we're seeing a trend now that, well, I say now, but it's been around for a while, but it's increasing that you're seeing hybrid um, programming models. So hy by hybrid, I mean you're using message passing, MPI, for example, and you're also using um, shared memory threads, um, OpenMP programming. Um, and I think you would have covered some of that yesterday. <coughs> so in these hybrid applications, you usually have uh, uh, one or more processes per NUMA region, and remember, you uh, have uh, yeah one or more NUMA regions, and um, and then the appropriate number of uh, threads will take up the remaining cores on your processor. So it becomes really important with hybrid uh, applications that you place well the placement of your processors and your threads, and uh, this can actually you know this is, this is a whole area of fine tuning as well for your application, um, and things can become quite complicated. But in order to utilize all the multi-levels of parallelism and to make the best use of the HPC machine, it's increasingly becoming important to actually think about how we can use um, the parallelism within one, uh, within one node, so thinking about thread placement and uh, parallelism, of course, across nodes. So just to give you an example of Archer, Archer has two 12 layer multi-core processors per node. Um, at the, each is 2.7 gigahertz clock speed. Intel E5 is being sent into 2697, which is Ivy Bridge processors. So not the cutting edge, but pretty good still. Um, each node has 24 cores, as you will know, um, and they are shared, shared memory um, architectures, uh, specifically NUMA. And if you have a look at some of the online documentation uh, um, for using threads, you'll see that there is some stuff about NUMA and uh, the number of threads that you can set and crossing NUMA regions and how this will affect the performance of your code, or usually typically does, because of course, accessing memory um, on another processor is not going to be as fast as accessing your, the memory on your own processor. Each node is controlled by its own iOS, uh, it's a single copy of Linux, and <coughs> we have about 
sort of 5,000 nodes um, connected by high speed is a network. Okay, so just a little bit about accelerators and where they fit in. So you will have met accelerators yesterday, GP, GPUs, and uh, Intel Xeon 5. So uh, typically, accelerators, when we talk about hybrid architectures, of course, we're thinking about um, the NUMA nodes and connecting these NUMA nodes by an interconnect. But um, hybrid architectures also include, can include, accelerators. So if we are going to include accelerators into hybrid architectures, we want to put um, several accelerators, or however many per node. So, or it could be on a subset of nodes as well. It doesn't have to be all the nodes that are available. <coughs> and of course, the nodes, as usual, are connected by interconnect. Now, uh, how accelerators communicate across a hybrid architecture depends on the, the hardware of the accelerator. So for NVIDIA GPUs, um, there is support for direct communication. What that means is that a GPU on um, one node can communicate with a GPU on another node and not have to do it via the CPU, or at least not explicitly. It doesn't have to go via the CPU. Whereas um, AMD GPUs and, and Intel Xeon 5, they actually require the CPU. So what happens is you've got your GPU on one node, say, um, your source GPU, and it communicates with its CPU on the same node, and it says, hey, I want to send some information or get some information from the GPU on this node, um, the destination node. Um, so that CPU copies all the information and then communicates with the CPU on the destination node, and then that CPU then copies information to the target GPU. So you can imagine that that's quite a lot of copying, um, lots and lots um, of extra copying operations, and so this is actually typically very slow. But those are the two sort of standard ways for GPUs or accelerators, I should say, to communicate. Uh, sorry, one, one other point I wanted to make was that <coughs> it's, uh, although it's not difficult necessarily to build large uh, machines that are basically GPU dominated per node, um, there are very, very, very few applications in the world that can actually take advantage of um, large distributed um, Accelerators. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so we're not there yet. <coughs> Very few applications can actually do this, whereas what you typically see is that applications can take um, advantage of parallelism of accelerators within a node. So we've got that, we're doing well on that front. <coughs> okay, so that's accelerators in HPC architectures. Now, just to finish off, um, I just wanted to talk a bit about the different tiers. So you may have come across uh, certain facilities being described as tier 0 or tier 3 or tier 1. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, so this is just a classification of machines. Um, and uh, as I'm, yeah, okay, I'll just, I'll just describe it. So different facilities be uh, belong to different tier, tier groups. So what we have is a pyramid. At the top, as you can imagine, tier 0 pan-national facilities. So these are facilities that typically on the mainland, uh, mainland Europe, I'm talking about Europe, um, are facilities that are owned or funded by several countries. Because they're funded by several countries, they, they typically tend to be very large machines because there's a lot of money um, that you can put towards building these machines. Um, and <clears throat> these machines are typically very fast as well. We're talking about tens, if not hundreds of blocks. Um, but not necessarily always. So, so we have, um, for example, the Mario Nostrum in Barcelona. We have Dupuy in Jülich, Germany. Um, these are all examples of pan national tier zero uh, facilities. Going down the pyramid at tier one, for example, Archer. There are still big systems, not quite as big. Um, we're not talking about tens or hundreds of petaflops now. We're talking about several petaflops. Um, uh, uh, but these are facilities that are typically run by a single country, so they typically tend to be uh, the largest HPC facility for that country. Um, but as I said, yeah, they don't necessarily have the peak, the highest peak performance of tier zero um, architectures. Not necessarily. As we go down, as you can imagine, uh, we have regional facilities. So um, in Scotland, there are several regional facilities. In England, there are a few as well, and there's, I think, one in Wales. And a regional facility is where institutions like several universities will pool their funds together and uh, build a machine that they can all access. So again, this is going to be more than, say, one university can afford or to build, um, but nothing like the size of Ar Ar Archer. Um, and then right at the bottom, we have Tier 3. So these are the 
the commodity clusters, the much smaller systems that have, say, for example, infinity band to connect all your distributed memory nodes. Um, and these are typically what your university will have, and you can access to them. Okay, again, there is a difference. <clears throat> so, of course, with large, uh, the large machines at the top, um, there is a bias towards big jobs. So you've got these massive machines, you know, hundreds of thousands of thousands of cores, and uh, there is a bias that jobs that require a large fraction, so high cap we call them high capability jobs. So if your if your job requires fifty percent of Archer, for example, we like that. And, uh, and there is a bias towards having a job by that one. Um, <coughs> as you go lower down, um, there's, of course, you can't run these massive jobs. Excuse me. <coughs> On the lower tier uh, machines, of course, because they just don't have the facilities. But um, yeah, and, and you will find that there's perhaps less of a job uh, bias at the bottom. So you, you would think that the main difference is, OK, at the top you have very large, uh, very expensive machines, and at the bottom you have smaller. Um, cheaper machines, and of course that is generally true. Um, but actually, counterintuitively, um, the architecture for most of the machines across this um, hierarchy is um, not so greatly varying. The main thing actually is, somewhat counterintuitively, is access to these machines. So at tier 0 and tier 1 machines, you have very formalized access. So what I mean by that is, if you want to use these machines, there are very standard ways of doing it. There are applications you fill in. There are calls throughout the year. You know, there are formal ways of applying for access. And there's a lot of support at the top. So of course, if you've got these really expensive machines, uh, there's money there for having good support. So um, those machines, this, um, those machines, uh, it's very important to exploit them as much as possible. So there's good support to help you make the most of those machines. Whereas as you go down the tier hierarchy at the bottom, it's a lot more informal. You know, it's your university. Uh, perhaps a uh, cluster and you know it's, it's, you don't have sort of applications to fill in or, or certain periods of time where you can apply for access you just talk to your supervisor or whatever um, and have access and there typically tends to be sort of less not, saying not, not, not less good support but typically less support um, and it might just be one individual or two individuals can help you make the most of that machine okay so just to summarize <coughs> Um, most HPC machines are shared memory nodes linked by um, an interconnect, and this is a high-quality interconnect for um, the supercomputers of the world. Um, most of these machines are hybrid architectures, so that's shared and distributed memory combined. And uh, typically, the standard model is that you use message passing, uh, typically MPI, uh, to communicate between the nodes. Um, but this does not really reflect the hardware layer. So, you know, thinking about all those layers of <coughs> complexity or those um, levels of parallelism, just passing messages between nodes doesn't exploit that. Um, accelerators can be incorporated, but only at the node level, and uh, it's very hard um, to write an application that can make use of a machine that has um, a large number of nodes with accelerators on them. And, uh, well, okay. Shared HPC machines span a wide range of sizes, so we've got from 10 or where you've got multi-metal, uh, multi petaflops, <laughs> number of million cores, um, down, right down to workstations that are connected by <coughs> a low-grade network. 